Hello and welcome to our webinar on tech opportunities in Singapore and Malaysia, jointly organized by SG Tech and the Internet Alliance of Malaysia. I am Ying Ying from SG Tech. Singapore is ranked among the top digitally connected countries, offering strong infrastructure, diverse talent, and vibrant ecosystem. Known for our low corruption rates and transparent public policies, Singapore has grown to become a trusted partner for ICT companies to develop cutting edge technologies for regional and global markets. Likewise, Malaysia. Malaysia has also uh, developed a sustainable and solid economic foundation, comprehensive business-ready environment, and dynamic skill, skilled workforce. As an attractive cost-competitive investment location in the region, Malaysia is becoming a preferred center for shared services and also leading in technology industries. So today's session will provide more market information and also potential opportunities for you to grow your business in both Singapore and Malaysia. Before we begin, I would like to highlight some house rules for the session. Firstly, a gentle reminder that this webinar is recorded and will be uploaded for, uh, to our SG Tech's website for marketing and archival purposes. For Q&A, we'll be conducting it uh, in a Zoom session later on. Basically, you just need to um, put in your questions in the Q&A box and selected questions will be answered. Please also help to indicate your name as well as your company name before asking questions. All right. So we will be conducting a Zoom Q&A in the Zoom meeting platform later on, where you will also get to network with companies from Singapore and Malaysia side. All right. So that one I will share later. Uh, we are very excited to welcome a very strong panel of speakers today from both uh, Singapore and Malaysia. Uh, we'll be inviting uh, both Yen, uh, Ms. Yen Cheong, Executive Director of SG Tech, as well as uh, Mr. Tan Tuan Kai, uh, President of Internet Alliance Malaysia, to do opening remarks. Thereafter, we'll have several topics covering Malaysia digital economy landscape, Singapore cloud framework, uh, IP innovation platforms, and also digital transformation in Malaysia. All right. So, Without further ado, let us begin a session with an opening address by Executive Director of SG Tech, Ms. Yen Chiang. Ms. Chiang is an international C-suite marketer, digital strategist, and change catalyst with 20 years of experience in diverse industries and cities across the APEC region. She has a wealth of experience in multiple roles with MNCs and uh, boutique firms alike, and was recognized as one of the APEC Outstanding Technology Leaders in Campaign 360 Women, Changing, Women Leading Change Awards, acknowledging women who have worked to ignite positive change through the introduction of new technology to the industry. So let's welcome Ms. Chong, please. Thanks, Ingin. Thanks for the introduction. A very good afternoon to all of you and welcome to the Tech Opportunities in Singapore and Malaysia webinar. To our returning friends, it's a pleasure to have you with us again. And to our SG Tech members and partners, thanks for taking the time to join us this afternoon. For those of you who may not yet know us well, allow me to give you a brief introduction of SG Tech and what we do. SG Tech is a premier trade association for the tech industry in Singapore. Within a rapidly evolving technology landscape, SG Tech strives to create an ecosystem that anticipates trends and develops sustainable initiatives to strengthen the community and help the industry grow. We represent and champion the interests of our tech industry, help our community build capabilities, create talent pipelines, and support business ventures overseas. We are currently close to 1,000 members and growing strong. Our member companies include startups, uh, SMEs to MNCs, and to champion and support the growth of subsectors within the information and communications technology space, we have industry chapters and committees supporting strategic and emerging sectors. So this is not our first event co-organized with Internet Alliance Malaysia. In July 2019, we led a business delegation of seven companies to Johor and met with Malaysia Digital Economy Corporation Johor State Investment Center and Iskandar Regional Development Authority together with 21 member companies. One of our members, Glee Trees, which created the first Asia-focused cognitive AI automation solution, found partners through the business matching sessions. 
Singapore and Malaysia are long-standing top trade partners. Under usual circumstances, being so closely connected, uh, one could have easily traveled to and fro the countries through a variety of transport options, as we know, air, rail, road, and sea. But we're now living in a new normal where travel in all forms is curtailed or disrupted. Nonetheless, SCTEC is proud to be able to offer you this opportunity to remain connected virtually in order for the business relations between Singapore and business to continue and, and thrive. Today, today, we are happy to bring you not just information on both countries, they will also be presenting opportunities for you to network with uh, potential partners and clients as uh, what Indian have introduced uh, earlier on. So in conclusion, together with Internet Alliance Malaysia, SG Tech encourages you to seize the day and I wish everyone a fruitful webinar ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chong. Now let's invite the president of Internet Alliance, who is also the founder of and CEO of Kinetics Solutions, Mr. Tan Tuan Kai, to give us his welcome address. Mr. Tan is widely known as the domain name industry pioneer in Asia. As the CEO of Kinetics Group, he has founded several internet businesses, such as digital service platform for resellers, domain name platform, and managed IT service provider. As an industry veteran, he has also a keen interest to develop and nurture the new talents for the next generation of internet leaders. Mr. Tan, please. Thanks, Ying Ying. Hi, uh, uh, very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the webinars uh, for the, uh, and also the networking events uh, jointly organized by SG Tech and Internet Alliance. Um, uh, of course, uh, many thanks to uh, to uh, Miss Yen, Miss Yen Cheong, uh, and the SG Tech team for organizing this Zoom meeting and as, as well as the breakout sessions. Uh, um, and I, I also get to know that, that there are a lot of uh, very encouraging response from the Singapore side. Okay. And uh, I also remember fondly about the July 2019 event in Johor Bahru, which was very exciting and uh, uh, it was very fruitful event. Uh, some business are actually uh, um, dance in the session itself. Uh, I, I was there, and um, uh, immediately after the event, we were uh, thinking of having a follow-up event in the in the following years. So I guess everybody know what's happening after that. Uh, we couldn't do so. In fact, we wanted to invite our Singapore guests to come to KL. We feel that uh, in KL we will have more participants because in JB is actually closer to Johor. <laughs> Okay, uh, today uh, uh, we are fortunate that we, we, we have this webinar and uh, we, we're going to talk about tech opportunities in Singapore and Malaysia. And um, apart from uh, we have uh, um, uh, Mr. Raymond Siva, uh, CMO of uh, MDEC to talk about Malaysia digital landscapes. We also have our members to present our stories about uh, digital transformation, especially during this uh, pandemic era, uh, which is hurting the, the uh, the economy badly, as, as, especially the SME uh, 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 players. So we will talk about, uh, uh, our members will talk about infrastructure developments, uh, business automation, as well as the talent development, uh, which is uh, also as critical as the other two. So prior to this, let me say a few words about IA, uh, Internet Alliance. IA is actually founded by a few uh, tech entrepreneurs 10 years ago. Uh, per, uh, initially, it was just to gather to solve problems specific to uh, interconnectivity and as well as hosting related issues. Uh, today, you can find the largest uh, data center providers, hosting providers, e-commerce players, all the leading uh, uh, e-payments, uh, fintech players, IT solution, managed services provider, and all within the IA community. So uh, as such, we are actually a growing association that uh, more and more members will be joining us. And all members are equal in IA. And uh, all uh, most of the participants are founders themselves. Uh, otherwise, they are the CEOs, they are the head of operations, and all of them are willing to share uh, their knowledge and to share their experience and to be able to network with each other. Uh, IA also represents the voice of the industries, the community, 
especially uh, in dialogue with uh, government authority agencies. We have a close ties with uh, MIDA, MDEC, MCMC, InvestKL, CDEX, and so on. And we also have a good relationship with other associations that are non-tech, for instance, like MRCA, SME, association and so on. So I actually have a, a deck about IA and I can actually share more with you uh, during the Q&A and the networking sessions and feel free to ask me questions about IA later on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tan. Next up, we will have uh, Mr. Raymond Siva from NDEC to give us a sharing on the Malaysia digital economy. Mr. Siva has more than 23 years of experience in journalism, strategic marketing, and crisis and issues response. As the CMO of MDEC, he heads up the Brand and Strategic Partnerships Division. Raymond, uh, Mr. Siva is recognized for his work in CEO leadership positioning, government and community communications, brand and marketing campaigns, as well as financial communications. He hosts an LLB from the London University of London and a professional diploma in public relations from the Institute of Public Relations, Malaysia. Let's welcome Mr. Siva, please. Hello and, and, and good afternoon. I, I noticed that I'm pretty dark with this background that I have. Uh, but yeah, thank you for having me, uh, you know, SG Tech as well as uh, Internet Alliance. It is really my pleasure to be here from uh, Kuala Lumpur in Cyberjaya. I'm in the office today while the rest of the colleagues at home uh, for good reason. And I hope that you guys are all staying safe as well. Yeah. So um, give me a little bit of time to, to run through this and, and go through some of the uh, plans we have to attract investments into Malaysia to welcome all of you that are listening in uh, to the opportunities that are in Malaysia. Yeah. Uh, Rene, can we go on to the next slide? So the Digital Investments Future 5 is a, is a strategy that we've announced uh, last week, which is really in line with the My Digital Blueprint, right? The Malaysia Digital Economy Blueprint that was announced by the Honourable Prime Minister uh, a couple of months ago, right? Uh, and we think that this focus um, on the DIF5, the DIF5 strategy, uh, will really allow us to, to welcome investments as well as to nurture the current investments in Malaysia uh, over the next five years. Okay, uh, next slide. So the Future 5 is really aligned to the My Digital Blueprint and the national investment aspirations, yeah? The national investment aspiration is under the Ministry of International Trade and Industry, METI. Yeah? Uh, so here for the people, uh, the blueprint talks about 500,000 new jobs in the digital economy uh, by 2025, 100% uh, uh, internet penetration throughout Malaysia, uh, as well as all students who have access to online learning. Now, this has been obviously exasperated by the current pandemic situation, where it's exposed the need to accelerate uh, you know, access to the internet and online learning to, to all our students. Right. Uh, when it comes to business, uh, we're targeting a 22.6% GDP contribution by 2025 from the digital economy. It's currently at about 21% uh, right now. Yeah. Uh, so we think we can uh, we can definitely achieve this based on how the digital economy is growing over the last uh, 24 months. Uh, there's plans to to develop 875,000 micro and small uh, enterprises, uh, primarily through pushing uh, investments into e-commerce and getting digital adoption done. Uh, attract two unicorns. Uh, or to, to develop two unicorns at the very minimum. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm happy to say that Grab is a is Malaysian nurtured uh, horse that became a unicorn uh, and then subsequently went to Singapore. Uh, we also have another unicorn, potential unicorn in the making called Qasim. Uh, if you just uh, you know listen to the news, they've been uh, you know going through an, uh, a merger, a corporate exercise that allows them to be valued at a billion uh, ringgit. And we have many others in the pipeline. And so we want to increase also the number of startups to 5,000 yeah, uh, over 2025. And uh, government is where we're big now on cloud services. Um, there's a there's strong willpower to push the government delivery services uh, on the cloud, uh, civil servants to possess digital literacy, and, and really uh, the integration of all government online services. Now, this is also mapped towards on the right hand side, you see the national investment uh, aspirations to increase the complexity of our economy. Uh, creating a high value job, which we define as uh, above 5,000 ringgit uh, in managerial positions, and as you go through the rest, right? <clears throat> okay, next slide, please. So, here, really, our target is to attract 50 billion uh, worth of investments over the next five years, right? Also, in line with the national uh, uh, digital economy blueprint that says it's 70 billion investments, 
50,000 high value jobs to be created, attracting another 50 Fortune Tech 500 companies. We have 40 now uh, in the MSC, and the plan is to attract another, another 50, right? The focus areas, and this is really more of interest for you guys, is the industry sectors, right? So we'll be focusing on these five sectors, agri, health, Islamic, digital economy, clean, and edutech, right? Uh, why? Because it provides uh, a latent uh, market opportunity. Uh, a very quick example here is that the food import bill uh, in Malaysia right now stands somewhere around uh, 48 billion ringgit, right? Uh, and so we believe that with digital intervention, with the advent of IoT, uh, there is a possibility, an immediate near-term possibility uh, to save 500 million to, to 1 billion from that 40 odd billion, right? And that in itself offers a, a market opportunity for companies wanting to invest in the sector, uh, especially on the ag tech sector, right? Uh, the same with health tech, uh, Islamic digital economy, we are the leader in this region. Uh, we've been holding this uh, for a long time, you know, where the world's largest uh, issuer of Sukuk uh, and Islamic fintech is an area that we want to push. Islamic e-commerce uh, is another area. It's, it's going to be worth a couple of trillions uh, in, in the global economy. Uh, so we invite investors to, to work with us, to, to join us in our journey to build this up. Uh, as the hub for, for the region, if not the world. Uh, clean tech and energy tech, as I, as I said just now, uh, the move towards ESG has necessitated a thinking around you know, clean tech as well as edu tech, and how can we democratize learning via digital uh, to everyone, right? It's not just in Malaysia. Uh, what can we do around the arts, science, maths, technology? What can we use, uh, you know, how do we use ed tech uh, to, to push that across all the underserved and the unreached? The focus tech, uh, these are really the building blocks, no surprises here. But I think we need to double down on artificial intelligence, cloud computing for sure, data centers, which is really the enablers, uh, cybersecurity, which comes as a natural uh, natural uh, add-on to the digital economy. Uh, but the complexity around cybersecurity, as you guys know nowadays, is, is shifting on, almost on a, on a monthly basis. Uh, so you know, I think, I think a lot of research and development work can be hubbed out of Malaysia. We, we have Kapersky and a couple of others here already. Uh, and how do we expand them, right? And digital content tools, not just on animation and VX, but we're talking about VR and AR. Uh, that cuts into also the other industry sectors that I spoke about. Emerging techs are, are something that we say are the big bets, right? And, and this five, uh, we are under no illusion that it will may change in the next one or two years, right? Uh, that, that really is what Zoom was seven years ago uh, when Lee Kashing and gang took a, took a bet on it, right? And, uh, and look at it now, right? Uh, because of the situation where we are at. Uh, so, you know, blockchain really is the founding founding tech for crypto and, and a couple of others. So I think we're looking at blockchain and drone tech. Drone tech, we've got two hubs. One is in uh, Cyberjaya already. The other one is Iskandar, very near Singapore, uh, where we have a hub there. We also have a blockchain hub in, in Johor. Uh, we're looking to bring in more edge computing, which I think would be a uh, alternative to hyperscale data centers, right? Uh, and I think that's something that, that we need to look at because a lot of uh, conversations being held about hyperscaling, hyperscaling data centers. But we believe that now with the advent of satellite technology uh, and we have Ankasa X coming up, we believe that edge computing will be really the, the, the last mile, so to speak, right? And I think we need to develop that further now with, with, with cloud solutions as well, right? Uh, extended reality and advanced robotics is for the manufacturing sector too, right? As we talk about fourth IR technologies that are coming in. Okay, next uh, slide. So here, this is our, our pyramid and how we look at it. So right at the bottom, we're saying that the digital global business services are critical. Yeah. So 10 years ago or so, Cyberjaya, Malaysia, we were well known for our SSO. Uh, and even now, we, we still you know, are very well known. Uh, but now we want, we want to take the next step forward, right? So the DGBS, which is the high value add activities, are now critical. So um, we've seen some of the issues that companies have told us, for example, uh, you know, I say this, uh, you know, without any malice uh, in the Philippines, when, when people transition to work from home, there was a problem with, with hardware, uh, with cloud, with also connectivity, right? There, there was a real problem. Uh, and so companies, uh, you know, are looking at also backups immediately, right? Where else do they go beside the Philippines? Uh, and, and, and Malaysia obviously is a home. They've been here before and, and now with, you know, the ubiquitous connectivity that we have, uh, the easy accessibility to, to all the internet devices and so on makes us a natural home. Uh, and also because of our talent that being graduated in this particular area, we believe that the DGBS uh, would be a strategic sector for us to, to uh, pursue uh, and to enhance again. Yeah? The focus tech, as I just spoke about, will focus on this five uh, and then the industries again. These are all mapped up to uh, the national investment aspirations. 
as well as to the MICE T 10x10 framework, which is under the Ministry of Science and Technology and Innovation. Yeah. So all of this comes together. So for investors, it's going to be that much easier uh, to deal with, with Malaysia. Uh, so uh, we have announced the DIO, the Digital Investment Office, which is a collaborative effort between MIDA, the Malaysian Investment uh, uh, Development Authority, as well as uh, MDEC. So the DIO then will work as a single window for any digital investments into Malaysia. And we democratize the digital investments throughout uh, Malaysia. You don't have to run to Penang or Sabah or Sarawak or Johor. You come to the DIO for your needs and we'll assess and, and evaluate what your needs are and then funnel you down to the respective uh, corridors or the IPAs, the investment promotion agencies uh, that are suitable, right? Uh, so that's really a step forward with the way we are looking at uh, investments and how we, we uh, want to facilitate and grow investments in Malaysia. Next. So these are the key initiatives for digital investments. The policy directory framework are, are, are very, very important. Uh, the digital infrastructure, so we talked about uh, uh, submarine cables as part of the DC, right? Um, and, and that's really important. Uh, you may have read about the cabotage uh, policy that the major has an ex exemption uh, to the cabotage policy, and that's being addressed uh, as we speak uh, right on top of the house at the cabinet level. Uh, we understand the need for that. Digital talent is critical, critical. And so just over the last six months, according to the LinkedIn report, and I don't know whether you guys had a look at it, there's five times increase in demand for digital skills, five times increase in six months. So there's no way we can feed into that right now. Uh, the demand has just gone through the roof, right? But what we, we have to look at is what are we doing about it in the next one or two years, right? Uh, so if we're not supplementing this by allowing foreign workers to come in, at least for the near term, while we build capability and capacity, the reality is that we will lose them to our other ASEAN neighbors, including, including Singapore. But I also read uh, uh, Honourable Minister Vivian Balakrishnan saying that there's also a talent crunch in, in, in Singapore. So I think that's that's really something that collectively, you know, uh, uh, maybe Singapore and Malaysia can look together and see where the areas of, of complement that we can we can grow together, right? And, and the agglomeration of both these digital economies could be quite powerful. Uh, incentives review, the MSC is 25 years, uh, MDEC is 25 years. Uh, so it's time. It's time for us as we celebrate our Silver uh, Jubilee to relook uh, what the Bill of Guarantees under the original MSE means and, and how do we revise that, make them more relevant uh, to the current environment. Uh, targeted lead generation and strategic collaborations with the local ecosystems are ongoing. And finally, is branding, right? Uh, so the brand uh, position that we've taken uh, is heart of digital ASEAN. Malaysia, heart of digital ASEAN. And uh, right now, the Malaysia Tech Month, we launched it today. It actually started today. Uh, Renee, if you can put it on the chat as well, MTM uh, 21. I invite all of you, it's free. It goes on for a month. Uh, you know, we had Nicho Kaku with Surina today, you know, talking about the future. We have some really good speakers tomorrow and throughout the, uh, throughout the month. So please do join us on that and, and uh, you know, contribute whatever you, 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 you can have here. Yeah? Okay, next slide. Some of the ongoing initiatives that we're having with Digital GBS. So we have a task force going with PICOM, Outsourcing Malaysia and the Contact Center Association of Malaysia really important for us to have data harmonization, right? And there's going to be a visioning report as well as a GPS day. Uh, so there's a proper policy put in place for all you investors that are coming in. There'll be a proper uh, structured uh, process to lend you and, and help you expand. Cybersecurity, uh, COE in Cyberjaya, data center, we have a task force going on on cloud investments, cabotage. And also if you heard about the DC licensing, uh, which has created a lot of uh, interest, a lot of feedback on the need to license the DCs uh, so there's an ongoing discussion there. Uh, Agritech, uh, we move hard and pass on it. We have the MOU signed with the CIMB Islamic Bank uh, and also with the Agriculture Ministry where we're giving out micro loans of about 15,000 ringgit to farmers via the, the cooperatives uh, to bring in IoT and to bring in other you know, technological advancements and improvements uh, to the agtech sector. Um, Health tech, ongoing Islamic digital economy. Uh, you'll hear more about this in the coming couple of uh, uh, months. And the global test bit initiative is really for foreign companies for emerging tech. So here, for example, if you're a drone company and if you're looking to build out so software solutionings, uh, you know, and, and you want to do a, a test bidding, we welcome you to come to, for example, the drone and robotic zone in Iskandar, Johor. And we would, you know, give you X amount of dollars upon you, uh, you know, putting an application in for you to come up with a POC, right? And upon the POC then, then the following years, we're, we're able then to, to help you expand on their POC. So whether it's drones for, for border security or agri or 
or anything, right? Delivery, uh, uh, there could be many things around there. So the global test bit is really for foreign companies to come here and, and, and you know, run a POC where MDEC will, will support, yeah? Next. So these are the, some of the key regional technology focus areas for you to look at. So if you look at the Northern Corridor, the DGBS and you know E and E in Penang, that's that's big. Uh, they have smart manufacturing up there. Uh, you look at Cyberjaya, we're looking at smart mobility and the creative content. If you look at Iskandar, I said just now, drone tech and blockchain. Uh, if you look at the East Coast economic region, uh, they're more on agri tech and smart manufacturing. Sarawak uh, has ag tech, 5G, IoT works, and then you have Sabah as well, right? And we're further going deeper into what are some of the key technologies that uh, are available there and also incentives for, for investors to go in there, right? The Sabah and Sarawak place is interesting because as you know, Kalimantan will host the new uh, Indonesian capital, right? So uh, they've got some really big ideas in there. And, uh, you know, obviously we, we have a head start there in Kuching as well as in Kota Kinabalu. Uh, so that serve as a really good proxy to, to the expansion play in uh, Kalimantan. Yeah. Next slide. These are some of the things uh, beyond investment promotion, what I'm back also at 12 o'clock. If you can see that it is incentives and, and support that we provide. And then if you go down, you go to the right hand side, see policy and regulations uh, that we're working on. Uh, we also have grants and incentives that we can support companies with. Uh, the ecosystem is fantastic. So any investors coming in, you know, we, we can connect you uh, to all of this. Uh, and the access that we have around the startups, right? Any startups, we've got the Malaysia Digital Hub, there's a co-working space. We've got the talents, we've got the online workforce uh, and, and the local tech community. And finally, is the foreign tech talent, right? Uh, expert. So if the companies here need to require to bring in, uh, like I said, just now no capacity or capability in the local workforce, then obviously we can assist to bring in the, the foreign knowledge workers in. And we've had that for the past really five years. Okay. And uh, this is just a, a visual just to share with you uh, the campaign. So the hitch is the Twin Towers of part of digital investment, digital skills, digital business. This is something that we're probably starting to, to push out, uh, you know, uh, putting forward uh, the creative and real stories of people in the in the digital uh, space in Malaysia, okay? And I think that will be it, Rene. Yes. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share. Thank you, Mr. Siva. Next up, we will have Mr. Ch uh, Mr. Raju Chalam, who will be sharing on the Singapore Cloud Framework. Mr. Chalam is the Chief Editor of the AI Ethics and Governance Body of Knowledge. He is a fellow of the Advanced Computing for Executives at National University of Singapore School of Computing and sits on several panels, such as the APEC Data Analytics Raising Employment, International Advisory Panel, IT Standards Committee, Club Chapter of SES, as well as Club and Data Chapter at SG Tech. Mr. Chalam is currently Vice President of New Technologies at Fusion X International and has been in the industry for the last 37 years in various organizations such as Dell, Tech Trenders Asia, HP, AMI Partners, and the Business Times Singapore. So let's welcome Mr. Challen, please. Thank you. Let me share my slides quickly. I have only six or seven slides. I will be very fast. So thanks, uh, the most important role that I have is uh, as Vice President for New Technologies at uh, FusionX, which is a Malaysian company, Malaysia Bule. So let's get on with it. I have the following slides, A, B, C, D, E, F, and I'm going to go through them very fast. Uh, I think I don't have to go through the credentials. Uh, as you see, I have a lot of free time, so I do a lot of free work. Okay, so the most important issue of all is the top applications in the cloud. Cloud is the de facto home for all data, for all applications right now. And just to give you an idea, just the, the market for AI and big data analytics alone is worth $90 billion on the cloud today. And it's an underestimate. In fact, it was revised and the big data market alone is now stated at $88 billion. And all of the big data applications or 99% of big data applications are done on the cloud. 
So cloud is a very big uh, part. Let me get rid of this. Uh, cloud is a very big part of, uh, of the ecosystem, not just in Singapore and Malaysia, but around the world. Okay, let's move forward. Business. Uh, when you look at the public cloud market in Singapore, it's currently growing from uh, 1.5 billion to about 3.6 billion in the next four or five years. Now, why is that so important? Because the bulk of the workloads are happening on a cloud computing environment. As you can see, according to the Boston Consulting Group, most large enterprises in Singapore have been using some form of cloud storage or cloud computing, right? Singapore enterprises starting to tap into more advanced use cases such as AI and machine learning. The SaaS model currently has 45% market share, but PaaS is the fastest growing segment. That is a platform as a service. And also uh, you can see a lot of other services coming up like cybersecurity as a service. And you also have AI as a service, which is also being pushed out of Singapore. So Singapore is trying to be a hub for ABC, AI, big data, and cloud. And it will be good for Malaysian enterprises to be part of this journey with us. <clears throat> so we have the government commercial cloud, GCC, which has a very specific purpose, which is basically to work with private enterprise in a PPP, public private partnership, to host all of the new innovations in AI, big data, IoT, 5G, whatever it is, on a government cloud, which government agencies can use as well. So you have, uh, a, you have three basically uh, CSPs, Amazon Web Services, Google, uh, cloud platform, Azure, which is Microsoft, and the GCC is managed by Extremax Private Limited. Government agencies can tap on commercial cloud software that you can try out on the government, government commercial cloud in Singapore, whether those innovations happen in Malaysia or with partnership with Singapore companies, you can come and try out all of these innovations on GCC. And for those who need training on GCC, the GovTech, which is a government technology organization, offers GCC foundation training. And you can get all of the training, much of it for free at, uh, at GovTech and GovTech partners. So please take make use of this uh, as your cornerstone to get into the cloud market. SMEs, as, as we all know, are uh, the cornerstone of all our economies, both in Malaysia and Singapore. SMEs uh, employ a bulk of the uh, workforce in both of our countries. In fact, in Malaysia, about 77% of SMEs are micro enterprises, which is less than 10, 10 employees. But these are where a lot of innovation is happening as well, because you have startups which start at a very nascent level with new technologies, and then they get picked up by large enterprises as well. So Singapore has got this uh, digital natives programs, Go Native Cloud, which you can also work with Singapore companies and take advantage on a real time basis. And these are real applications. There's real funding available uh, with, with uh, co-funding subsidies for employing labor as well as starting new projects on, on either cloud or cloud-based platforms. The best way to, to, to get uh, and tie up with uh, Singapore companies is through SG Tech. SG Tech has 1,000 members, including startups, SMEs, MNCs, ICT companies, non-ICT companies, and it's a good platform for you to come and leverage all our expertise, which is contained in one organization, SG Tech. And SG Tech is the authorized uh, association also for a lot of subsidies that are channeled to, to enterprises. Therefore, you have a one-stop shop where you can get all of the information, you can get partnerships, you can 
also connect with government agencies through SG Tech. So it will be a great idea for you if you are not a member, is also try to be a member if possible, or at least tie up with a member of SG Tech, and you can come and partake of all of the the goodness that Singapore offers. Uh, last couple of slides. Trusted data framework. So data, uh, we have got very strong data regulations in Singapore, but we also have a government authorized trusted data sharing framework, which uh, is intended for use in the commercial and non-governmental sectors, but excludes data sharing in or with the public sector. However, it has a huge number of data sets where you can get third party data, you can do data analytics, data POC using the framework details, which is downloadable as a PDF statement uh, on the government website. PDPA or PDPC, uh, Malaysia was first in, in the ASEAN region to start PDPC or PDPA, the, the uh, Personal Data Protection Act. Singapore followed, Malaysia started in 2012. We started uh, implementing in 2016 and the Singapore PDPA regulations are very, very strict. The fines are extremely robust. So it will be great for all Malaysian companies as well as Singapore companies to be uh, conversant with the provisions of PDPA and make sure all your employees are across uh, personal data protection and privacy. So I am the chairman of uh, the data cloud in cloud standards, there are two key standards, which are two sides of the same coin. On one side is security, on the other side is outage. So that means cloud service providers, for instance, have to ensure that their cloud is secure and that they have certified security protocols in place that customers or enterprises can use to ensure that all of their workloads are held securely in the cloud that they choose. It's the public cloud. On the other side is also the outage, which is, which is that not only should the cloud service be secure, but it should also be available. And there should not be a lot of downtime. And the downtime should be within restricted limits. And those documents are also available for you for free downloads on uh, on Singapore government websites. And we can have more discussions on this during the, the breakout session. And this is my private email address. Please feel free to email me anywhere, anytime on any device. And I will respond to you within six hours. Because as you know, Singapore and Malaysia are neighbors and we never sleep. So thank you very much. Back to you. Thank you, Mr. Chalam. Next up, we'll have Mr. Eric Ku, Deputy Director at IPOS International, who will be sharing with us on the topic of IP and your business. Mr. Ku heads the Global Engagement Business Development at IP IPOS International, where he manages his overseas expansion. Prior to joining IP uh, Academy, Mr. Ku was with Thomas, Thomson Reuters as the Business Development Consultant and also the IP and Science Solution Consulting Team in Southeast Asia, and also HP, where Eric was responsible for IP portfolio management and technology licensing. Let's welcome Mr. Eric Ku, please. Thank you so much, Yingying. So let me just pull up my slides. All right, uh, very good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you so much for joining us in this uh, uh, webinar today. Um, so the topic of my sharing here today is actually IP slash IA and your business. Um, so just to make sure that I get this correct, the IP that I'm sharing here today is intellectual property and not internet protocol. And the IA that I'm sharing here today is talking about intangible assets and not in internet alliance. Okay, just wanted to get some of this uh, um, acronyms out of the way first. Right, so for those of you who are not familiar with who IPOS or IPOS International is, right, let me just do a very quick uh, two slide spiel about who we are. Right, so IPOS is actually a government agency in Singapore that's under the Ministry of Law. Um, so primarily, if you as an applicant, you need to file for any kind of IP protection, 
So that means trademark registrations, patents or designs and so on. You will go to IPOS to do the filing. And IPOS International, which uh, is the organization where I'm from, it is actually a wholly owned subsidiary of IPOS. And you can look at us as the expertise and enterprise engagement arm of IPOS. And the next slide will show with you a bit more about what is it that we actually do within IPOS International. So three main things that we actually do within IPOS International. Uh, what you see on the leftmost side of the screen is actually advisory services. Um, so we realized that a lot of enterprises, especially for small medium enterprises, right, when they start to expand the businesses, whether it's going to be locally or going overseas, um, they don't actually fully exploit the value of the intangible assets. And that's something which we find is quite a pity because, um, especially for startups, when you actually start your own company, a lot of times you don't have a uh, a full tangible assets to start off. So that means you don't actually have real proper, you know, office space, production cap capabilities and so on. So the key thing that you actually want to focus on at the startup stage is actually what are your intangible assets? So this is one of the services that we actually provide, which is to help companies, especially, you know, uh, early stage and even, you know, small medium enterprises who are actually starting to grow your business to understand the value of your intangible assets and how to actually use it to grow your company further. Okay, and in the middle part of the screen, um, that's actually our search and examination services that we actually provide. So when you file a patent application with IPOS, what happens is that the search and examination application process will actually come to IPOS International. And within this uh, group itself, there's also expertise that has been developed over the years, which is to help identify what sort of technologies that, you know, whether it's going to be countries or companies around the world are putting their focus and emphasis on. So with this kind of insights that you can actually gain from patents, right, you can then potentially identify what are the white spaces, which are the hot tech areas, and who you can actually potentially work with. And finally, on the right side of the screen, then it's um, our training and uh, training services. So we offer anything from short-term half-a-day courses until about a two-year part-time master's program in Singapore. Right. So just to give you a very quick spiel about who IPOS and IPOS International is. Right. So today's agenda, I'm going to talk to you very, very quickly about what are intangible assets, uh, what kind of IA you can actually find in your business. And also, I'm going to share with you some resources that you can actually take home later on as well. So really, what are intangible assets? If I were to just very quickly summarize it, of course, intangible assets is then the opposite of tangible. So tangible are assets which you can see, touch, feel. So generally, we're talking about machinery, we're talking about buildings, we're talking about land. Whereas intangible assets are your assets which tend to be, cannot be seen in that sense. So if you look at this diagram over here, the largest circle in purple, so those are generally what we call the intangible assets, which you typically do not think about as an asset most of the time because these are what you call unseen assets. You don't really see them on a daily basis. However, just because they are not seen, it doesn't mean that they are not valuable, right? So talk about if you are a drug company, for example, in the top uh, leftmost part of this circle, you'll see regulatory approvals. So for drug company, what's most important to them is to be able to carry out clinical trials and then be able to get the regulatory approvals to start to market and to sell the drugs. So that piece of regulatory approval is very, very important to drug companies. But, you know, it's not really what you see as a tangible asset, but this is actually intangible. So going around the circle, you have different kinds of intangibles, such as your copyright code for software companies, data. So for companies like Facebook, uh, Google, data is paramount to their existence. Trade secrets, know-how, and systems and processes, and so on. So the wider purple circle are generally the non-registrable assets. So you don't actually need to register but you need to have a way to actually manage them in that sense. So if I go into the middle part of the circle, you'll see that there's a couple of line items over there, which are orange. So these are what we term as your registrable assets. So that means you do actually need to register them in order to have the legal rights over them. So this would be your patents for inventions, trademarks for your company name or logo, domain names, registered designs, plant varieties, and so on and so forth. Okay. 
So that's to give you a very quick overview about what are intangible assets. Right, so intangible assets are non-physical in nature, but they are value generating. So as I mentioned earlier on, uh, just because you don't see them, it doesn't mean that they are not valuable. And you should also think of them as, an, as a business instrument because these are instruments that can actually help you to grow your company. Do, uh, a lot of times, I think a lot of companies might be thinking, okay, when you're talking about patents and trademarks and so on, that's something that's very legal in nature. And that's not a wrong thinking. It is legal in nature. But you have to use this as tools to actually help you to grow your business so they can be seen as a business instrument to help you to grow your company. And of course, um, not all intangible assets are equal. So within a product itself, you may have many, many different kinds of IP protection about it. And it, each of these different kinds of IP protection will protect a different facet or part of your product. And I'll go into that in a bit uh, in a later slide. Right, so just to highlight to you the importance of uh, your intangible assets uh, to a company. So this slide highlights, um, if you take a look um, on the left side of the screen first, right? This is China's 10-year digital uh, transformation from 2010 until 31st December last year. If you take a look at the top left most over here, you will see that in 2010, the top 10 companies in China are primarily petrochemical or banks related. Okay, so very, very heavy on tangible. So you have your plants and, and refineries and so on and so forth. Move 10 years down the road, right? And you see who's actually at the top of the list. It's actually Tencent, Alibaba, and then you have Meituan, Pinduoduo, and so on. So these were companies which 10 years prior did not even exist in the top 10 list. And now they're actually starting to top the top 10 list. And these are companies which are intangible heavy. So Tencent primarily, you you know them as you know the messenger uh, payments and of course uh, gaming as well and and so all these different companies as you see who are now starting to come into the top 10 charts in terms of the market value is now quite heavily uh, centered around tech companies and especially important also is that by leveraging your intangible assets to grow your growth can be so um, phenomenal in that sense so back in 2010, um, if you take a look over at Tencent over here, its market value was 2,638 RM, uh, uh, RMB over here. But 10 years later, it has actually grown to 45,000. And you look at a company 10 years ago that topped the list, right? PetroChina from 19,000. It actually dropped to about 7,000. Yeah, so intangible asset i think is is going to be one of the key things that you actually want to look at when growing your company in the future right so as i promise um i, I talked about what are intangible assets and that how they are not equal and another concept i want to emphasize and also to put quite a lot of stress on is that your product can be supported by many different kind of ip protection so not just one single kind so if you look at this Nespresso, Nespresso machine, which I think a lot of you will be quite familiar with, it's protected by things such as the logo, which is protected by the trademark. You have your milk frother to help you to make your nice cup of uh, cappuccino with the foam, right? That has got a registered design. So that means it protects how it actually looks. You have your capsules, which you then plonk into the machine and then somehow magically the, the beans are being roasted or you know, steam is actually applied to it and it comes out as coffee, right? So there's a pattern that actually protects that particular method of extracting the coffee. And if you were to take a look further, or you have copyright for your marketing brochures, trade secrets for the blend of secret ingredients, you know, what kind of robusta, what kind of arabica, coffee beans, what's the percentage and so on that goes into each and every single capsule. And of course, you have your Nespresso Club as well. That data is important because they are able to then identify who you are as a consumer. What's your consumption pattern like? What kind of coffee is suitable to your taste? And they can then push out the relevant kind of marketing information to you. And of course, to tell you, hey, I realized that you know your your coffee supply for the month is going to run up soon. So should you, would you be interested to have get a new supply and perhaps I can offer you kind of a discount code along the way. 
So all these different kinds of intangible assets and uh, IP actually can come together within just one single product. So that kind of IP and intangible asset protection is actually very important to help you to grow uh, your company. Okay, so intangible assets in your business. So if you take a look at this chart um, and think about what we talked about in the previous slide for the Nes Nespresso machine, right? So if you today as a newcomer or entrant into this particular space, you want to compete with Nespresso, can you replicate the business model easily? So can you come up with the patterns to fight Nespresso's? Can you come up with a new brand name? Can you come up with a new trade secret and so on and so forth? There's going to be quite a lot of hurdles for you to bypass Nespresso in a sense, right? And, and, and this chart really kind of like um, um, uh, accentuates that point, which is if you have a strong product with strong intangible asset protection, right? You can have continued sales for a very long time. If you have a successful product, however, you don't have a strong intangible asset protection. So anyone can actually come in and take away your market share, right? So while initially you can grow your market, you cannot defend it for long, okay? So intangible assets are really one of these defense barriers that you can actually have to prevent your competitors from coming into the same space as you. Um, so this, this couple of uh, pictures over here, I just want to share with you, which is uh, very important because when you understand the, the importance of your intangible assets, right? Then you also need to think about how do you manage your intangible assets? Um, so it's, it's, it's funny, like um, in, in my office, right? The particular monitor that you see on the top right side of the screen, we have what we call an asset tag. And of course, your, your computers and so on and so forth. So typically within an office space, you'll find that there are asset tags tagged to certain physical items. And this is because you want to track your spending. And of course, along the way, you want to amortize you know, your spending on these physical assets along the years as well. But it's very seldom that I come across a company that actually has an intangible asset tracking mechanism. So that means, do they actually track what kind of intangible assets that they have? How many patterns? Uh, what are the trade secrets that they have? What are the trademarks that they have? Uh, even down to, let's say, you know, information, data, supplier list, and so on. I don't see many companies actually doing that. And that's actually one of the very, very key components of your company. So if you're doing this tagging for your physical assets, right? Why are you not doing the tagging for your intangible assets? And, and I think knowing your intangible assets will, will allow you to grow. So without this tagging and this whole management, then you're just leaving your intangible assets out there by chance and hoping that they'll actually grow your company. And you're also opening them to say, you know, if, you're, if you're one of your key employees actually leave and takes this information with them, so what happens after that? So I think really uh, intangible assets, not just to identify, but you also need to categorize them and give them the correct uh, um, protection. Right, um, so just very quickly through this slide, um, your intangible asset management strategy um, is not something that is produced to be standalone. It has to gel and blend in together with your business objectives. Okay, so whether you're going upstream, so that means if you're working with someone to help you to supply certain products or services to your company, or you're going downstream where you're actually looking for suppliers and other companies that you can actually work with, oh, sorry, not suppliers, distributors, or that uh, you're looking into JVs, you're looking into, you know, let's say a franchise agreement and so on and so forth. In almost any kind of a business setting, you will invariably come across intangible assets. Um, so some of the typical kind of um, documents that actually contain, you know, intangible assets or IP in there, your employment contract, so if your employee works for you and comes out with an invention, who actually owns that, for example? If you go into a JV, what kind of uh, information does each party bring into it? When you sign an NDA, what kind of information are you sharing along with each other and so on? So don't think of intangible assets as something that is only to be managed by the legal department. It comes hand in hand together with how your business strategy is going to be. And you should look at it as a tool to support your business growth. All right, so um, just to summarize and very quickly uh, take you through some of the points that we talked about. 
Number one, it's important that you identify what you have, right? So if you think you have it, classify it. So this is where we are talking about the tracking of intangible assets. Assess the relevance and current and future business growth of your, of your intangible assets, right? So if it's worth protecting, right, you should actually protect it and don't leave it to chance. So uh, don't leave money on the table. If you have it, manage it. And finally, there is a budget. Uh, there's something for every budget. So if you need help, get it. Um, a lot of companies will ask, it's like, okay, I, I understand that, you know, intangible asset and IP protection is important. What are the associated costs with it? Um, so there are ways in which you can protect your IP for a little money. Um, some forms of IP protection are a bit more expensive. So I'm not saying that you should protect every single thing across the board because just like your business expansion plans, you will need to prioritize your resources into areas which actually needs the money the most. So look at what are the key intangible assets in your company and do the necessary protection along there. All right. Um, so just to share with you on the very last slide, um, I understand that this is a quick 10 minute session. So the information that's shared is uh, quite a fair bit for you to uh, absorb. But if any of you are interested to find out more and that you do have some issues, for example, what you see on the screen over here, how do you know whether you have actually valuable uh, assets? Uh, what do you look out for when you're actually starting to expand overseas and so on, right? Um, just yeah, open up your mobile phones, uh, you know, open up the QR code scanner, scan this particular screen over here. So we do provide 45 minute complimentary chat sessions if you have any questions or issues related to intangible assets and IP. All right, and with that, I've come to the end of my last slide. Thanks so much for your time and I'll hand the time over back to Ying Ying. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ku. Maybe uh, Mr. Ku, you also like to paste the link inside the chat for the- Okay, sure, I'll do that. Thanks yeah. so much. Okay, next up we have Mr. Lim Ming Kai, Deputy Director at IPI Singapore. He'll be sharing with us on the topic of uh, capitalizing growth and global partnerships through IPI's open innovation platforms. As the head of partnerships, Mr. I, uh, Mr. Lim develops and promotes collaborations between IPI and network partners. He is also responsible for IP's, IPI's flagship technology event, Tech Innovation. The team is active in fostering partnerships and with international innovation networks and marketplaces to support the innovation needs of Singapore-based enterprises. Let's welcome Mr. Lim, please. Hello. Uh, thank you, Ying Ying. And thank you for the invitation uh, to, to invite IPR to give uh, this uh, uh, presentation uh, to your audience. Um, let me quickly share my slide. Right, okay. So what I'm going to talk about today um, has some relevance to what uh, Eric uh, talked about uh, earlier on. Um, just before I start, I'll just give you a very quick uh, introduction about uh, IPI. So IPI, we are a non-profit uh, organization. Uh, we've been around for 10 years uh, since uh, 2011, and we are a subsidiary of the Enterprise Singapore. I mean, for those of you who do not know Enterprise Singapore, it is the government agency that helps uh, Singapore SMEs uh, go international uh, and grow their business. Uh, what we do uh, at IPI is uh, we support the innovation ecosystems of the, the enterprises in Singapore uh, to accelerate the growth of SMEs through the use of technology and innovation. And we do this by uh, helping them, um, by giving them pro uh, professional advisory services, uh, as well as uh, linking them to our global network of uh, partners. So in short, IPI is an innovation catalyst that makes use of the open innovation uh, model. Uh, and then we try to create the opportunities for enterprises to grow beyond uh, boundaries. And boundaries here, we mean the current technical limitation, as well as the boundaries outside of uh, Singapore. Um, the kind of a target audience, uh, the, the customers that we deal with are the, the companies, the enterprise, especially uh, the SMEs, uh, they are looking for technologies. Uh, just now, Eric talked about uh, using IP, uh, intellectual property, and, um, and uh, uh, IA as a strategic assets. For those companies that develop their own technologies or IP, um, Eric talked about how you can um, file uh, or protect them uh, through pattern, through trademark, uh, through copyright. So these are for the uh, IP owner. The kind of um, the enterprise that we deal with uh, comes from the other side. Just these are mainly 
the technology seekers, the IP seekers. So many, many SMEs, uh, unfortunately, they have a very limited uh, amount of uh, resources. They want to create products. They want to create uh, high-tech products. Um, they want to develop IP, but they may not have all the resources uh, to help them to do that. And what can they do? First of all, they can make use of the open innovation model. They can work with another a company or organization or entity that have already developed the IP and are willing to license to them. Or they can develop their in-house R&D uh, capability, but this usually will take a long time and there's no guarantee that whatever R&D investment that they put in uh, will have uh, any uh, outcome. So this is where uh, IPI comes in. You know, we come in to help them uh, to find the IP and the technologies that they need to develop new product services or, in, or improve uh, their businesses. This is a, a wide, I mean, IPI provides a wide spectrum of uh, services uh, for the companies. Um, as you can see, um, we provide open innovation services to uh, innovation advisors program, uh, to innovation marketplace, and as well as we have a, a, a wide network of uh, partners. And also we conduct um, uh, forums and, and talks uh, on uh, to talk about technologies and trends um, in, uh, in, the, in, uh, in the sector. And we cover a wide range of uh, technology domain from food uh, to materials, to energy, to infocoms, to healthcare, uh, to personal care. So as long as the companies uh, have an innovation needs in one or more of those uh, technology domain and they require assistance like you no know, find the, the IP, find the technology or the find the expertise which they do not have, they can come to us and we will help them to find the partners that can that will cooperate with them and provide them with the necessary IP or the expertise. And we do that through uh, various uh, platforms. Uh, first of all, we have this uh, uh, innovation marketplace. So it is a it's an online uh, database where we compile the technology offers, um, which is the IP from our various uh, partners. And our partners can be a deep tech startup, uh, can be another SME, it can be a researchers or a large uh, organization that have the IP that are made available for commercialization. And we also have uh, companies uh, who are looking for IP and we call them technology seekers. Typically they want to develop a new product, but they do not have the, the full technology capability or the IP that can create that product. And they are also open about you know, sharing uh, their innovation needs. And we make use of this uh, online uh, marketplace to publish the technology offers as well as the technology needs uh, so that you know, we disseminate this kind of information and make it transparent uh, for any uh, enterprises out there to come and search. So if you are a, a enterprise looking for IP, this should be your first stop to see whether um, the IP technologies they're looking for can be found here. And if you're interested, you can contact us and we will connect the parties together for a discussion. And the end outcome is that both parties will enter into some kind of a, a collaboration, either a joint venture or technology licensing uh, or a, a co-development uh, agreement. And the end outcome is that uh, you you develop, you get to develop your products or enhance products through the use of technologies that are developed uh, by the partners. Um, the other platform that we have is uh, our flagship event called Tech Innovation. Uh, this is a large scale technology brokerage event. Uh, in the past, um, we organized it as a physical event, but of course, uh, um, uh, in the last uh, two years, uh, because of COVID, we are not able to uh, organize it as a physical event. And we and for this year and for last year and this year, we are converting it into a virtual uh, event. But however, the essence of the event still remains the same. Is we want to connect uh, worldwide technology providers and technology seekers to come together in 
to look for technology solutions, to look for co cooperation, uh, business and op opportunities in one or more of these themes. So this year, the theme for tech innovation is on green and sustainable future. So we will have uh, speakers talking about you know, trends, the uh, innovations uh, in, in green building, how do we achieve a zero waste? How do we achieve a zero carbon? As well as um, showcasing of uh, technologies in those areas uh, where the companies can actually adopt uh, and to make use of to develop new products or services or to help you to achieve uh, meeting the zero waste or zero carbon or making uh, you achieve a, a green building uh, the outcome. And the other areas that we have is on food and nutrition. So we'll be talking about noble food like alternative protein and uh, how do we, how do we uh, secure our food uh, sources and technologies that can be used in uh, agri-tech and agriculture. And the third area that we have is on health and uh, wellness um, in uh, manufacturing for manu manufacturing technologies for uh, medtech, uh, digital health, as well as for uh, personal care. So this is a free event for visitors. Uh, so it'll be held uh, 28th and 30th of September. Uh, so it's going to be one of the largest technology brokerage and commercialization uh, event in Southeast Asia. So you will be expecting about maybe three to 400 enabling technologies that are made available for commercialization. And we have also partners looking for market partners like you uh, to cooperate. So please go to our website and sign up. It's totally free. And just come to the end of uh, my presentation, just before I end, just to give you a, a quick um, overview of uh, what the other kind of um, uh, forums that we have. So on a regular basis, we organize a networking event um, on, let's say, on, on food, on technology commercialization workshop. And sometimes we, we do have a, a white paper that we publish together with uh, some of our partners, like, for example, uh, battery recycling, um, uh, wastewater treatment, the how, how do we clean the air. Um, this can be conducted over the physical or over a, uh, a, a Zoom, right? And if you want to find out more about such um, events and forums that we organize, uh, please feel free to sign up for our uh, newsletter. And every week we send out a, our technology alert on what are some of the new technologies or new IP that we have that you can make use of, as well as uh, the events, forums and sessions that we have that you can attend, All right? Thank you very much. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, see you at the uh, breakout room later. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Lim. Next up, let's invite Mr. Alfred Tan. He'll be uh, CEO of MNC Tech Solutions. He'll be sharing with us on um, projects in Malaysia during the pa uh, pandemic. So Mr. Alfred Tan is currently the CEO of MNC Tech, serving as the Chief Entrepreneur and Storyteller. He has more than 20 years of experience in various business units covering Asia Pacific and Indian subcontinent. He has previously worked in HP, NEC, Dell, and also Avancer. So let's welcome Mr. Alfred Tan, please. Thank you, Ying Ying. Really appreciate this time. Um, I hope that everyone can see my screen. I'm going to pull it up. All right. Thank you again uh, for the introduction. And really, it's a privilege to have uh, all the Singapore as well as Malaysia entrepreneurs and businesses that we able to share and talk about collaboration and partnership. It's really some, uh, some about 2020, uh, 2016 that basically I left Singapore. And right now, uh, think, uh, doing businesses basically from this standpoint of uh, collaboration has brought us uh, not only for South and Southeast Asia, but also for uh, the entire uh, Asia Pacific, where we work together with many other companies that is basically focused on data-driven contact strategy. Now, um, let me introduce the company. MNC Tech basically is a license, uh, sole licensee for Avanza uh, for South and Southeast Asia, where we focus a lot on uh, digital marketing, sales, learning management system, um, prop tech, uh, call centers, hospitality, retails, and automotive uh, products, basically through partnerships. Now, uh, from those uh, perspectives, we basically bring in more uh, 
partners not just from Malaysia, but it's also partners from Singapore that we work together with this our market. Then we bring in uh, um, more activities that basically uh, focusing on uh, in, in helping this transformation or digital transformation from those companies that uh, we are serving in Malaysia as well as in Singapore. Now in 2019, we already felt the situation that is not really uh, sustainable for many of the cu customer in Singapore to operate in a smaller way if they basically require more support. There's a lot of businesses basically actually focusing to bring them into Johor or to KL. So we saw that happening when we see these services comes in, where we bring in a lot more consultancies to them, uh, bringing other partners uh, and in talking about how to support their business uh, in, um, in their process to modernize and digitalize their, their businesses uh, through a cloud call center technology or omni-channel or focusing on marketing. Um, those integration that is required for bigger system or for a smaller system, but we also provide those training that uh, is very difficult to, to, to touch at, at that point of time. But right now it's become more and more prevalent. And of course, other business opportunity that we work with. Now, if you look at the, the, the current partnership that we work with, it's not just exclusively with MNC Tech. I believe uh, I speak uh, together with my team of IAM members here. We, uh, we, we basically open our, our, our arm basically to any uh, technology partners in Singapore that probably serving this type of industry in Singapore and would like to actually work in Malaysia. I currently work with many Singaporean company that break, basically we work uh, from our own partnership that bring in technology that is not available in Malaysia or more advanced in, from Malaysia that we actually collaborate and work with the client. So these are the current partnership that I'm currently working with, uh, PropTech that basically uh, from an organization that is uh, well known. Um, and they basically uh, work with Malaysian, uh, Thai, uh, Vietnamese, as well as um, uh, in, uh, Thailand, Indonesia, and Singapore market. So we also have tech automations that basically uh, uh, require uh, in, uh, for the automotive and also for chatbot, um, sales and marketing, hospitalities, or retails, and of course from fintech. So um, the point that we that I'm going to highlight today is a lot of time when we work on, in terms of the collaboration, we find that a lot of uh, Singapore partners also facing uh, some difficulties, where especially from the startup or from the uh, smaller or the SMEs, where they find that um, call supports basically for agent is very expensive sometimes to actually deploy from India or to deploy from uh, Philippines. And because their operations are smaller, they're basically looking into how to actually outsource them to Malaysia. So we find that there's a lot of our digital industries or digital client in Singapore that basically right now deploy the call center in Malaysia. But we also found that uh, through our partnership, through the work that we work with client in Malaysia, uh, uh, is, a, is a big companies that basically, a couple of big companies basically required uh, data labeling for AI, for tech automations. Um, they come to us for help and basically we provide those partnerships that can help in terms of those automations in Malaysia rather than trying to sub them out into other country because of the client um, experience in Malaysia. So another thing that we basically looking into also is programming uh, where a lot of talent uh, basically drain. In, in fact, it uh, was uh, one of the speaker or two of the speaker highlight earlier was draining in terms of talent. Uh, basically, Malaysia still have those talent that is available. Of course, it's, uh, it's shrinking because everybody is trying to get those talents. But we do, by working uh, through partnership and through uh, JV or through uh, uh, some sort of teaming that we propose, uh, we basically can able to help each other in terms of uh, um, sharing the IP or through licensings. So of course, the other part that basically we have been working um, tremendously well with Singapore companies uh, in Malaysia. Uh, but besides uh, what you call Singapore companies, we're also working with Australian and New Zealand companies that basically work them as our online sales agents, basically based in Malaysia, which is basically um, not uh, focusing in Philippines or in India, but basically from Malaysia. The reason why is because of the language that we have uh, and the, the, the proximity that will be basically nearer to uh, those countries. Then besides that, of course, the hospitality, retail, retails and uh, concierge services. And then of course, uh, for the uh, data 
analytics that basically uh, be part of the most important uh, part of the uh, talent source that is uh, needed here. So I cover very, very fast in terms of what I would like to share. Uh, um, and I hope to, uh, you know, able to share more uh, in our breakout session later. Thank you so much, Xingming. Back to you. Thank you, Mr. Tan. Next up, we have Mr. Lloyd Lee, Vice President at AIMS Data Center. Mr. Lee is the Vice President and of Sales of AIMS and APEC Regional Sales, and also Head of the OTT Division under Time.com Bahad. Mr. Lee has been instrumental in leading the sales team to grow new revenue and maintain double-digit growth for both companies since 2006. As VP of Sales, Mr. Lee is responsible for developing business strategies and opportunities, creating sales leads, building channels and partners for the company. Among the key accounts handled by Mr. Lee are Alibaba Group and Tencent Holdings. Let's welcome Mr. Lee, please. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, let me share my, my screen. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Lloyd from Ames. I'll be sharing with you uh, the digital infrastructure in Malaysia. Uh, things that I will cover today are the data center industry, the latest development in the cloud services space. And also, uh, lastly, I will share with you the growth area where tech company can focus in Malaysia. Let me start by giving you a short introduction of Ames, the company that I work in. Ames was established in 1994, in the early years when internet starts to become popular. We are in all kinds of internet related services like web design, download services, and so on. It is not until the year 2000, we streamlined our business to focus on data center services. So from a very humble beginning of 5,000 square feet, we constructed at Monaro Ames. We have today grown into one of the most connected ecosystem data center in the country with more than 100,000 square feet of white space in Malaysia. We also have footprint in Singapore, as well as Thailand. Okay. So in terms of data center, Malaysia data center is operators are concentrated in the state of Selangor. Right? Bulk of the data center are in uh, Cyberjaya. Cyberjaya itself, there are seven major operators. Uh, the, they are like entity, uh, CSF, PCCW, Ames, Spaces Bay, uh, Bridge Data Center, and TM. But all these are purpose built DC. Out of Cyberjaya, there are Ames and TM in the KL City Center. There are also two operators, HDC and Hightech Padu in Shalam area. The other region where the government or states is trying to spur the data center investment is the Iskanda region in JB. Now TM and Keppel has a data center over there. In terms of total industry revenue, currently it stands at about 1.7 billion ringgit. And this is projected to grow to 3.5 billion in, the, in 2025. So what is spurring this growth is the entrance of global cloud service provider into the Malaysia market. Currently, the only global cloud service provider in Malaysia is Alibaba Cloud. They set foot in the country in 2018, right? And lately, there are a lot of activities in the market. Company like AWS, Microsoft Azure, and Tencent Cloud is planning to enter the Malaysia market. And I believe that they will offer cloud services in Malaysia by early next year. On the local front, we are not short of local service provider. These are a few of the company that are listed here, like IP Server One, AVM Cloud, Azabai, Shinjiro. All these companies are IA members, and they have been in the market for many years. If you are looking for partners, you can always look at the IA directory. 
uh, we, we are more than willing to work with you all. So, you see, all the global service provider has done their market research and they see huge growth potential in the cloud market. Now, the underlying infrastructure is ready and I believe that there will be many projects that center around helping the customer to go on board to the cloud, helping them to do migration and advise them on cloud security framework and also helping them to manage resources in a multi-cloud environment. Well, you see that there are many opportunities in the enterprise market. We should not ignore the SME market as well. Currently, the cloud adoption in SME is still quite low. So if you are a software as a service provider that provide accounting services, payroll services, automation services, there are many potential customers out there that you can target. You can also provide digital marketing services and help all these SME to onboard to the e-commerce platform like Shopee and Lazada to widen their market reach. Lastly, the e-commerce, the e-wallet uh, e and contactless payment is also becoming very popular in Malaysia. Uh, when you go to the major shopping market, where the retail chain, or even when you visit the wet market, the fruit seller and or the butcher are offering, are accepting payment using e-wallet. So the pandemic has actually accelerated many digitization efforts among the businesses in Malaysia. So I just want to share with you some statistics on SME in Malaysia. SME make up about 98.5% of the business establishment in Malaysia, and it employs 62% of the workforce, contributing more than about 40% to Malaysia GDP. And this is the segment that is worst hit by the pandemic. So the government is allocating 104.1 billion, especially to assist the SME through various economy stimulus package. And one of the focus is to facilitate digitization efforts among the SME. So in short, there are many that opportunity in the market and we should not ignore the SME market. Yeah. That's all for my sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Next up, we have Mr. Lance Chiang, Founder and Managing Director of VLAN Asia. Mr. Chiang is an experienced senior entrepreneur who had started several businesses since he was 22 and currently owns and manages four different companies in technology, shared services, and business consultancy, business tech consultancy. He currently employs young and energetic individuals to manage engagements in seven countries across Asia, and is a pioneering and leading Microsoft cloud service provider in the SME space in Malaysia. Let's welcome Mr. Chiang, please. Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen. My screen good. Okay. All right. Is my screen good? Can you guys see my screen? Yep. Okay, cool. Now, uh, thanks for having me on board. Uh, quite delighted to be part of this uh, session. Uh, I'm sharing my deck about VLAN Asia. I call this my partner insights deck because I actually share this with anybody who wants to listen to me, basically. Um, a bit about ourselves. Uh, we are actually a technology concierge service. We are actually out there to help our customers do better with cloud technologies. So you can call us a cloud service provider per se. We are actually a very strong proponent of the XAS subscription model. XAS means anything as a service. Lah. So uh, that's how I sustain my business from day one until now. Uh, so everything that we do is actually as a service lah, in a sense. Our focus segment is actually mainly in the SMB and also the SMC segment. Uh, that means the small, medium businesses and small, middle corporates, anything between 10 to 500 people, customer, employees, that's our focus segment in terms of sizing. Uh, we have four focus pillars in terms of products that we carry. One of them is about organizational productivity, which is using Microsoft Office 365, customer experience lifecycle using HubSpot and Zendesk, 
account simplification and automation using zero and also infrastructure as a service for Microsoft Azure. Lah. Right. So essentially, this is what we do, but this is what we are, and these are the kind of products that we carry. Um, right now, because you see, we do a lot of engagements with our customers, uh, with customer experience. So our angle, usually, our insights are usually quite overarching because uh, we engage our customers, both the external customers and their internal customers. So the internal problems for our customers also we know. Lah. So their issues also we know. So we see a lot of opportunities when it comes to uh, digitalization, when it comes to IR 4.0. These are some of the events that we actually held over the past couple of months, essentially to, to talk about certain uh, industry, uh, industry verticals, uh, essentially uh, stuff that we see opportunity in. And that's why we actually engage with uh, industry practitioners regarding uh, about this uh, uh, some of these topics are. So uh, the first top left one you see enabling digital capabilities for the Malaysian SMEs through COVID-19 crisis. This one, the angle for this uh, webinar was more on payments. So basically, in, ter in terms of payments, there's a lot of uh, business payments, service providers, solutions providers uh, available uh, and, and opportunities to offer for industry verticals. Uh, for example, there are a lot of startups right now that allow, there, there are some startups that allow tenants to pay their landlord's rental using their credit cards. Uh, so basically this BPSP, this business payment solution providers vertical is actually for the property rental business. Uh, and payment solutions, oh, these payment solutions all uses credit cards. So for this example, this uh, example is, is quite uh, consumer centric. So there's a lot of opportunities to branch this into commercial space as well. Because you see credit now is actually very important now. I mean, credit card facilities to accept digital payments now, right? I mean, it allows your debtors to actually stretch their credit terms a bit better. So especially now during this economic climate, it's actually very important now. I would imagine that the e-wallet space is actually quite crowded now. Uh, and there could be some consolidations here and there, but uh, but having said that, digital bank license is still up for grabs. So that's another opportunities when it comes to the payment space lah, and, and also the banking space. Uh, the middle, mid, top middle part you see is Rebound Asia. This is actually a uh, NGO that we are part of. So basically right now, there are a lot of people who need to be reskilled because they have either been retrenched or companies need to upskill their staff. So a lot of new technical skills, more relevant skills are actually very useful, uh, especially now that there's also a very big push for women advocacy, right? Through, because, you know, this thing called the pink recession, uh, somehow the recession actually hits women, women employees a bit harder than men for some reason. So the pink recession is actually very real. So Rebound Asia uh, is actually there to upskill and reskill women coming into the tech industry. I mean, they teach stuff like CRM, coding, customer experience, AI, drone tech, e-commerce and such. So there's a lot of opportunities when it comes to training as well, upskilling and reskilling and certifications. Uh, Bottom left is, uh, is, was a session that we did together with uh, DHL. Basically, uh, logistics and storage, there's a lot of uh, opportunities for uh, store, uh, warehousing as a service now, actually, if you think about it, because uh, uh, there's this thing called warehousing on demands, because a lot of companies now realize that, that a lot of, they spend a lot of money on fixed costs. Uh, for example, uh, companies, a lot of, they spend a lot of money on warehouses that are now probably empty because uh, they need the space, but then they might not have the goods or they might not be able to get the goods from overseas because shipping lines are so clogged up right now. Right? So they have the space, but then they're not using it. So they're spending money, unnecessary money. So there's companies that do, uh, and logistics companies that actually offer warehouse as a service to get storage on demand right now. So even you can get warehouses, warehousing space or storage space on subscription. Uh, so that's another opportunity that I see uh, opening up and of course uh, now that last mile actually now that last mile last last mile solutions last mile delivery solutions are actually quite cutthroat now because everybody throwing price like crazy so sometimes you can actually deliver stuff for under three or four ringgit to point a to point b within the clang valley so last mile delivery can be quite cutthroat uh, so it's probably not as lucrative anymore so uh, that's uh, probably less opportunities when it comes to last month, but maybe more opportunities when it comes to either logistics systems and then uh, warehouse management systems or even warehouse, warehouse subscription. 
Uh, the bottom center one you see is actually a session that we did together with the uh, Malaysia Ph uh, Community Pharmacies Guild. Uh, because not now uh, healthcare is paramount now, everybody is talking about healthcare, everybody talking about pharmaceuticals. There's a lot of doc, doc, docs, uh, book docs, speed doc, doc to you, doc on call, <laughs> all sorts of docs. Uh. So there's a lot of startups actually disrupting the traditional medical profession. Uh, because especially now a lot of people are quite worried about going to clinics, hospitals. So a lot of pharmacies, a lot of medical practices, they're still very traditional and they're very risk adverse. So there's a lot of opportunity to uh, digitalize some of the internal processes to stay relevant, especially some of the, even the bigger chains are uh, they can be quite manual. Some of their, their, their patient management systems can be actually quite manual. Uh, and of course, there are a few other opportunities in terms of uh, channel management, channel sales management, in terms of self-service. Uh, face it, because most millennials these days, or even the young people, right, they don't like to engage with sales reps until they actually do a lot of research on their own. Right? Um, there's actually a study that actually says that 76% of uh, people right now actually prefer self-service as, as opposed to somebody actually serving them. So uh, a lot of, a lot of, uh, millennials who are actually moving into uh, decision-making positions now globally, right? not just in Malaysia or Singapore, it's globally. Right? But millennials, they are actually moving towards decision-making positions now. Uh, they, they tend to do their own research. They tend to do their own... Uh, uh, they look into products or services offered by a company through their social media, through their social media engagements, through their website, before they even engage with a person. Uh, sales rep. So there's a lot of people who prefer self-service. So self-service is actually very important. So if you're a channel player like me right now, we, because all of the solutions that we carry, mainly are channel solutions, right? So if you are, you, you need to be a bit more agile and to adapt to this new trend. So we, so we actually build systems to actually uh, allow our customers to do self-service uh, subscription solution, uh, subscription, subscriptions uh, so that they can actually do stuff on their own without having to engage a, a sales rep on our side. So self-service options are actually going to be very important moving forward, if you ask me. Right? Now, moving into the manufacturing sector, right, which, which so happened that I'm actually quite active now in. Uh, there's, see, in, in Malaysia, there's this, there's this uh, uh, agency called MITI. MITI, uh, I think it's called the Malaysian International Trade uh, and Industry Agency. Like basically, they, are, they actually have a service uh, that assesses manufacturing companies and they score them for their IR 4.0 uh, readiness. And <laughs> unfortunately, a lot of these manufacturing companies don't score very well. Uh. They, are typical, they are typical, very manual, labor-intensive kind of company, uh, manufacturing companies. So COVID really hit, hitting a lot of uh, manufacturing firms very hard. So if you look at the scoring here, it's quite typical across many manufacturing companies. So if you look at this uh, from, the, from, the post, from the position of, uh, of product management for the, for, the, for the company, right? you can see opportunities in terms of all of the areas that you see here because they score very low. This is, this is just one example of one of the companies that I'm aware of. Uh, but it's actually very prevalent across a lot of manufacturing companies in Malaysia. So uh, I would think that WMS, warehouse management systems, ERPs, accounting systems, subject security, performance management, product lifecycle solutions, all of these are very, it, it can be a very good opportunities here in Malaysia and for the manufacturing sector. When it comes to shop floor automation, again, same thing, shop floor, uh, basically the manufacturing floor itself, um, a lot of our manufacturers are still very highly manual because uh, again, labor is cheap, lah, unfortunately. So uh, because now again, COVID, a lot of people are unable to hire foreign labor. So robotics uh, and process automation can be very uh, can be very useful for some of these companies. Uh, the good news is a lot of our agencies are also offering grants, so you can work with some of the some of our local SIs, local players like us where we can help you to actually help the customer to apply for grants to automate some of their backend processes, integrate them between the departments and floors, things like AI, RPA, uh, data analytics, Wi-Fi devices, all sorts, and anything that plays uh, uh, on the shop floor, uh, all of this in the manufacturing vertical can be very useful. Lastly, uh, in the manufacturing sector as well, uh, again, the people's readiness is also not there. 
uh, a lot of people are very uh, behind times when it comes to training as well as, as awareness in IR 4.0. So LMS solutions can be interesting uh, for a lot of manufacturers who do not have the online learning management systems to upskill their staff. Uh, so a lot of people need training in this area and also certifications. Lah. Things like leadership, lah, you know, you've got your technology savviness, lah, competency, lah, strategy, and all this stuff. So there's a lot of opportunities in training and personal readiness as well. So just to quick recap on some of the opportunities that I see uh, in some of the sectors and some of the areas that I am directly involved in uh, is logistics, training, upscaling, healthcare, manufacturing, uh, process automation, and also payments. Lah. All right. Uh, Happy to take more Q and A's uh, later when we go into the breakout rooms. Uh, I'm also happy to be to, to engage with some of you guys from Singapore as well, so that we can see how we can approach some of the manufacturing or some of the other verticals that you guys are interested in, because we have got connections or links to most industries now. Back to you guys, Yingying. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chiang. So right now, we are going to enter into the Zoom breakout rooms for us to continue the Q&A as well as do the networking. So can everyone please um, click on to, let me paste the link inside the chat. Uh, either, you can either scan all the QR, scan a QR code or click on the link in the Zoom chat or type in the Zoom meeting ID inside the Zoom uh, clientele to enter the Zoom breakout room. All right, so panelists as well, please do the same. You can click on the link in the chat and also uh, or scan a QR code to be directed to the Zoom breakout rooms. We will have colleagues everywhere to guide you along. Yeah, so we'll see you over there. For all the panelists also, please um, click onto the chat, uh, the link on the chat to be directed to the room. I'll see you over there. 